Tonight's message is a simple message. It's entitled, Faith, Not Feelings. And like I said in the opening, this is more of a teaching session. It's important to instruct and keep faith ever, ever before God's children for an, a number of reasons. If you want to please God, you have to live by faith. You may know what faith is. You may be able to recite and rehearse scripture after scripture about faith. But unless you practice faith and live by it, you won't please God. We are born in our feelings. We are raised in our feelings. Feelings are a part of us. They are ingrained in us. And it's so easy to let your life be ruled, dictated, and manipulated by your feelings. You grow comfortable in your feelings, and you shouldn't be as a child of God, because you're to live by faith. You're to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And if you're a child of God, the scriptures apply to you. It's not just a preacher thing or a minister thing. It's for every child of God because the word of God is for every child of God. It's here for you to feast on, to dine on, to live by. Faith in the word of God. That's what separated the early church and made them such a force. That's what separated the heroes of the faith and made them such a force for God. But too many Christians have settled into feelings. Yes, they became born again. Their soul cleansed and made new, but then they stopped there. Or they would go on to get the Holy Ghost and they would stop there. If you're going to live by faith, if you're going to please God, there comes a point where you turn your attention from your soul and you got to focus on your mind. Because to live by faith, you have to have the right kind of mind. And we're going to get into that later. And that's where so many Christians have lost it. They settled for less. Like I preached in, an, in a previous sermon, they wouldn't keep climbing higher. They wouldn't take steps of faith. They settle for less, and that displeases the Lord. Faith, not feelings. Faith, not feelings. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So if you desire or want to be justified in the eyes of God... In life, and then at the end of the journey of life, you better live by faith. To make this pilgrimage through life and reach the goal, heaven, it will be by faith, not your feelings. Because God rewards faith, not feelings. Faith will bring you God's grace in abundance to see you through this life victoriously. Feelings will be a hindrance and a stumbling block. Feelings will quench the flow of grace in your life. Children, of, child of God, remember, from the start of the journey, your journey in the Lord, to the finish, faith, not feelings. If you want to please God, faith, not feelings. If you want to do His will, Faith, not feelings. If you want to reach God in your desperate hour of need, whether you're in need of a healing or a miracle, if you need a bondage broken in your life or a great need supplied in your life, it will be by faith, not your feelings. By faith. If you want mountains of troubles removed out of your life, if you want to walk the stormy seas of life, it will be by faith, not your feelings. If you want to be protected and sheltered in the lion's den, if you want the violence of fire of those tribulations and trials quenched when you're in the fiery furnace, it's faith, not feelings. The just shall live by faith. 
If you want to see yourself cross the finish line into heaven, it'll be by faith, not by feelings. From faith to faith. That leaves no room for your feelings to manifest. Faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. It was by faith, not feelings, that Abraham could be called the father of the faithful. Faith, not feelings, enabled Abraham to be obedient to the word of God that commanded him to sacrifice his beloved son. Feelings would have ignored God. Feelings would have disobeyed God. Feelings never would have done such a thing. To sacrifice your only, your, your beloved child. Abraham loved Isaac more than anything in this world. But the key for Abraham, he loved God even more. By faith, not feelings, Abraham was able to reason with God and trust his word. Knowing that God promised him a mighty nation through Isaac, seed. And so, Abraham was able to believe that if he obeyed God and killed his son, God would have to raise him from the dead because he knew God could not lie. So he was willing to kill his son because he trusted God and his word that much. How much trust do you have in God's word and God's promises? Is your confidence and your trust in God and his word and his promises that great, as great as Abraham's? Abraham was willing to put it all on the line because he knew God was faithful. Or when you come into a dire situation, do you allow your feelings and circumstances to overwhelm you and dictate your actions and your words? What rules in your life, faith or feelings? You're not going to know the answer to that on the mountaintop. You'll know the answer to that down in the valley, in the fiery furnace, when you're tried and tested. That's where you'll find the answer. No one can honestly, unless they've been through the valley and the fiery furnace, they can't answer that because you're not going to know until you face it. Can you trust God this way, the way Abraham did? Do you love God as Abraham did? More than anything in this world, in this life. It was faith, not feelings, that brought the walls of Jericho crashing down. God's word instructed the Israelites to walk around the city walls of Jericho one time a day for six days. Then on the seventh day, they were to walk around the wall seven times. But during their journey, throughout the whole week, they were not allowed to say a word. Not to those in front of them, not to those behind them. Why is this? Well, God had to use this opportunity to bring Israel out of their feelings and into faith in order for the miracle to take place. By obeying the word of God and keeping their mouth shut, they, that meant God was in control. So they could not express their feelings as they're walking, their opinions, their complaining, their doubts, their discontentment. Zip. No expression of feelings allowed. Instead, they obeyed the word of the Lord in silence. Then after seven days of obedience and no feelings being verbalized, now they're ready.
to lift up their voices, to shout with a voice of faith. And by the shout of a voice of faith, God's power brought the walls down. It wasn't the trumpet sounding. It wasn't their voice that brought the walls down. It was the power of God through their obedience, through their voices of faith. Let this be a lesson to your own life of just how God works. When in need, speak only faith. Speak the word. And if you're struggling with feelings or doubts or fears, don't speak at all until you can speak faith. Get alone with the Lord for however long it takes. Reason with him. Reason with his promises. And as the Bible says, speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Speak to yourself in faith, not in feelings. And the same holds true with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't speak your feelings and opinions to them. You speak faith. You speak the word of God. Unless you become a hindrance to their deliverance without even realizing it. Faith, not feelings. Enable Gideon and his 300 to bring deliverance to the nation of Israel. Now God had to be patient with Gideon and the 300. In the beginning, God calls Gideon to perform this awesome task, but, God was, but Gideon was not ready. Just because you're called to do something doesn't mean you're ready to step right in and perform. No, God calls and then he prepares. Gideon was not ready. There was a time of preparation and faith building in his life before God could use him. And when God revealed his will to Gideon, Gideon, for that initial measure of faith, puts out two miracle fleeces. God answers in a miraculous way. This was the foundation. This was the start of getting Gideon ready to perform God's will. But then, next, Gideon's army had to be prepared. Not just Gideon. Gideon's army, too. They had to obey the will of God in all this as well. 32,000 men gather to help Gideon. But God can't use just any kind of people. God uses faith people, not feelings people. People who are led by their feelings, people who everything is dictated by feelings, God can't use them. God will move them out of the way. God uses faith people. People who depend on him, people who depend on his word. And that's the way it was in Gideon's day. Just examine the word of God. This is how God works with humanity. Gideon puts him to the test. Everyone's afraid, go home. 22,000 go home. 22,000 living in their feelings. 22,000 not willing to put self on the line for God and his will to be accomplished. God can't use that. God doesn't need numbers. God needs faith. They're put to the test. You see, God, he doesn't give the spirit of fear. God gives power, he gives love, he gives a sound mind. So if you're fearful, fearful of life, fearful of the future, fearful, fearful of people, fearful of troubles, fearful of the devil, you're living in your feelings. You're not living by faith. And God can't do but very little for you. If you're living in fear, face yourself. You're coming up short because you're going to have to face it sooner or later. Face it now with the help of the Holy Spirit or face God on tomorrow when it's too late. God doesn't give fear. He gives power, he gives love, he gives a sound mind. And by faith, 
we accept those things from God by faith. Gideon furthers the test. One test wasn't enough. Another test comes for the remaining 10,000. He takes them down by the river. They're all thirsty. Those in feelings get down on their knees, put their face in the water, and drink to satisfy their thirst. Never even concerned about the enemy that's nearby. Only consumed in feelings. How thirsty they are. Their selfish desire to satisfy and quench their thirst. That was first and foremost in their mind. Not the will of God. Not the enemy in the land. Those in faith, the 300, they kept the enemy and the divine mission at the forefront. They were very careful. Yes, they may have been very thirsty. But carefully they knelt down, scooped up water, and took a little at a time. As they watched for the enemy. Because God and his divine mission was at the forefront of their minds, not their selfish desires to quench their thirst. What rules your life? What directs you? Is it faith and the Word of God, or is it your feelings, your desires, your wants? What dictates your daily life? That way you'll know whether you live by faith or live by feelings. Faith will cast feelings aside to put the will of God first, even over your own selfish desires. God directed Gideon. Now that everyone's in place, God has a faith people ready. Even though it's only 300 didn't matter to God, because of God before you, who can be against you? 300 ready. Still, God directs Gideon to go down to the enemy's camp for one final measure of faith that will make him ready. At the camp, Gideon privately hears a conversation among the enemy of how one has a dream of Gideon bringing victory over them. All of this preparation took place so that God could have a people. No matter how small, he had a people in faith that would perform his will. Again, the feelings had to go, the fear had to go, the doubt had to go, the selfishness had to go. It had to be removed in order for God to do his work. Otherwise, God couldn't do it. Faith, not feelings. This is what enabled a young boy named David to boldly stand up against a mighty warrior giant, Goliath, who it is believed he was over nine feet tall in height. A young boy. He enters the Israelite camp, and he finds everyone in this camp afraid of the giant. His brothers, every soldier, even King Saul himself, afraid. No one wanted to face Goliath in battle. When David hears the giant openly defying God Almighty and mocking the armies of Israel, he's immediately ready to accept the challenge. No, no wavering. He's immediately ready to go out and take on this giant. Now, how is it possible that a boy was ready to do what grown men were afraid to do? Take note of this. This is a picture of the Christian world. King Saul and all of those armies, men in the army of the living God, should have been ready, should have been lining up. Casting lots, who would go and take on this giant? But they were all in their feelings. 
none of them were worthy to face the giant. But remember, at this time, David was a young boy. And he was the shepherd, the caretaker over his father's flock. And what this meant that he spent most of his days alone, in the fields with the sheep. But he was not alone. He lived in the presence of God. David being away from people meant being away from their contamination in their spirit. Their spirits of fear, their spirits of disobedience, their opinions, their doubts, all of their human weakness. He was away from that. He was in the presence of God. David's time in God's presence built up his faith. As he prayed, as he meditated, as he wrote psalms, different psalms in the fields. God was preparing David when he didn't even realize it. Then in the presence of God, when a lion and a bear came after the sheep, he went out and he killed them. What would you have done? Take your pick, lion. Take your pick, bear. Have what you want and go your way. When we face life circumstances, that, that's what reveals just how close we are to God or not. Not by what we assume or think of ourselves. How we respond in adverse situations in the valleys of life, in the lion's den, in the fiery furnace, how we respond, that reveals to us just how close we are to the Lord or not. David killed them both. Now, David was being prepared by God to face the ultimate test. You see, each step of preparation and faith was leading David towards a greater battle. But that meant a greater victory for God and his people. In the camp of the Israelites, study David and his speech. It was faith talk. There was no feelings and self in anything he said. Whether he spoke to his brothers, King Saul, and the giant himself. It wasn't what David's going to do. It was what God's going to do. God will do this. God will deliver you into my hands. Self was not at the forefront of David's vocabulary. God was. And that's because God was at the forefront of his life. Child of God, learn a lesson. Live by faith. Don't just talk it, live it. Live close to God in prayers and fastings and abiding in the Word. Let God prepare you as He did David to get you ready to face the lions and the bears so that you'll grow stronger in the Lord. It will build your trust and your confidence in God because sooner or later, mark my words, the giant is coming into your life. In some form or fashion, Goliath is coming. And God is expecting to send you forth to face that giant as a trial of your faith. But the greater the battle, the greater the victory. And your faith will come forth tried as pure gold. Your giant may be in the form of financial hardship, it may come to you in the form of tribulation of any kind, problems, even sickness. Sickness unto death. But God gets the glory when you come forth in victory. So that's the thing. That's the key. Be like little David. Make sure you're ready. Get ready and stay ready because you don't know when that day's coming 
and the lion's going to show up, or the bear's going to show up, or Goliath is going to show up. And when Goliath shows up in your life, you're too late. That's not the time to try and get ready. Chances are you're going to be defeated. When God willed you to be victorious... And you'll walk a road of defeat that wasn't in the will of God. All because you neglected to get ready and stay ready. And what does that mean? It means more time in the presence of God daily. And less time in the presence of people, in the presence of society, in the presence of entertainments, in the presence of distractions. More time in God's presence. The story of David proves age and experience does not matter to God. He was a young boy. King Saul had fought many battles. These soldiers had fought many battles. What matters to God is divine faith. Because without faith, you cannot please him. And without faith, he cannot use you. Jesus is the Son of Man. He is our perfect example of faith. And Paul wrote in Hebrews 12, 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He put it in us, and he will complete it. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus came into this world for only one purpose, to fulfill the plan of redemption. And yet, his feelings despised the shame and the suffering in God's plan of redemption. His feelings, his flesh despised it wanted nothing to do with it. His flesh did not want to endure the pain, the agony, and the shame of the death on the cross. And it, re re it manifested in the Garden of Gethsemane. The internal struggle within him between flesh and spirit was so great that his sweat became his drops of blood. He pleaded with his father, please, I do not want to do this. Remove this cup. But Jesus was, as the Son of Man, was a man of faith. And deep down inside, he knew the will of his Father. He knew why he was there, why he came to earth. And so by faith, he submitted himself to God and brought his feelings under subjection in order to go to the cross. And he prayed, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Have you ever pray prayed such a prayer in your walk with the Lord? Have you ever been in such a situation? To make such a sacrifice? And I don't mean physically dying. I mean where God wants you to do something, and there's nothing in you that desires to do it. What do you do? What have you done? Have you ever been in that situation that God called you to do that you didn't want to do? To sacrifice for God in a way that your flesh did not want to sacrifice. Examine your relationship with the Lord to know if you're living by faith or if you're living in your feelings. Because, think of this, ponder this. If you only do for God and obey God and sacrifice for God when you feel like it, that's not living by faith. Not at all. Because you're doing for God because you feel like doing it. Because you want to do it. Where's the faith in that? 
some Christians will be in for a rude awakening when they go into eternity. Because everything they did for God was because they felt like it. Or they wanted to do it. Where's the faith? That's all feelings. Where's the faith? Where's the sacrifice in that? The Bible says you cannot please God without faith. Faith is required to be in action if you're going to do that that you don't want to do. Faith must be in action. You must be living by faith to sacrifice and give of yourself in ways that you don't want to. Let's consider the ministry of Paul. The sacrifices he made to do God's will and win souls. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Five different times he received thirty-nine lashes on his back. His back cut up, healed up, scarred up, and then it's done again to him. And the same process over and over, five different times. Can you imagine after the fifth time of 39 stripes, how bad his back must have looked? It wasn't pleasant. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Have you ever been out in the ocean in the pitch black night hanging by maybe a piece of wood? In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. When you take that and compare it to your own life, if you grumble and complain, you ought to feel ashamed of yourself. All of us should. Because I dare say no one here has faced this. Paul didn't grumble and complain. Nor should we. We have it pretty good. In fact, probably have it too good for our own good. You know, Reverend in a future giant little book that I read, he made this statement that I never heard him say before, I never thought about it. He says a lot of Christians today, they are in need of more persecution. They're in need of more persecution. Not that they have too much. They need more because they've grown too comfortable in this life. Too comfortable in the flesh. It's the persecution, like in Paul's life, that gets you moving and going deeper in the Lord. Paul's flesh, he did not enjoy these sufferings. And no doubt, I'm sure his feelings again and again resisted the will of God. He knew everywhere he went that angel of Satan was following him. It was going to stir up trouble. To what end, he didn't know, but he was going to have to suffer. And he did. City after city. Year after year. But look what he accomplished for the Lord.
Paul had to learn how to deny self and live by faith in the Son of God. And he wrote in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. The life he lived in the flesh, he didn't live by feelings. The life that he lived in the flesh, he lived by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul knew suffering in the will of God would cause God's grace to abound in his life. That the power of Christ would rest upon him. So that in his weakness, God's strength would be made manifest for the glory of God. Study Mark chapter 6. If you're in one who's in need of a miracle or a healing, study Mark chapter 6. Because in the beginning of this chapter, Jesus is ministering in his hometown of Nazareth. And because of this people's feelings and their flesh, they were full of unbelief. So Jesus' power was limited. The Bible says he only laid his hands on a few people and they were healed, but that was it. That's at the beginning of the chapter. Now go to the end of the chapter. Because at the end of the chapter, Jesus is in the land of Gennesaret. And in faith, they gladly received him. And it says in Mark chapter 6, verse 56, And whithersoever he entered in this land, into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch him if it were the border of his garment, and as many as touched him were made whole. Study the difference in these two places, Nazareth, Gennesaret. How they responded towards Jesus. And then the results. Are you in your feelings or are you in your faith? Are you in the flesh or are you in faith? Faith in God heals the sick. Remember Demas. Demas at one time was a companion and co-worker with the Apostle Paul. But in the end, Demas forsook Paul. Why? He stopped living by faith. He gave over to his feelings. He gave over to the flesh. Demas' vision lost focus on Jesus, and he refocused on this present world and all that it had to offer. In feelings, I'm sure Demas was weary of sacrificing for souls. I mean, if you're working with Paul, you're getting persecuted. So he probably got weary. And when Paul was arrested the second time in Rome, the circumstances look dire for him and the whole church, because now the whole church is being persecuted across the empire. Now Demas is looking for a way out. He turns his attention to a better life for him in this world. Paul lived by faith. And he endured unto the end, the end of this life. And today the crown of life is his. Demas, he did not endure. He went into his feelings and he lost everything. Oh, in the short term, physical vision, it appears that Demas had it better off than Paul. Paul's in prison about to be put to death. Demas... He steps out of it, goes about his way to live a selfish life. But I guarantee you in eternity, Paul had it better. You see, feelings put Demas in hell. Faith ushered Paul into heaven. 
Jesus promised in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. You know what Jesus is saying? Live by faith. Live by faith unto the end of the journey. You'll have a crown of life. The just shall live by faith. And how do you live by faith? From faith to faith? How do you go from faith to faith without allowing feelings to hinder and become a stumbling block? Because, like, we're born with feelings. Feelings is a part of us. So how do we do this? Two things. A child of God must learn to deny themselves and then take on a spiritual mind. The two together. Matthew 16, 24, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. How do you do that? Paul gives the answer. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove or demonstrate what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? So the only way, child of God, you're going to demonstrate God's will in your life, it's not by being born again, only. It's not by receiving the Holy Ghost. It's then by taking on a spiritual mind. Paul is telling the church what God expects of each member of the church. He's writing and telling them, this is what God expects. But to come into this, you church members have got to possess a new mind, a new way of thinking. And prior to this, in Romans 8, Paul talks about it. Verses 6 and 7, For to be carnally minded is death. He's writing to the church, not to sinners. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Do you have life and peace from day to day? If not, check your mind. What kind of mind do you got? Is it carnal? If it's not life and peace, it sure isn't spiritual. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. This is where Christians miss it. This is where they drop out. This is where they fail God. This is why they're so weak, up and down, in and out, up and down, in and out, so inconsistent. The wrong kind of mind. They may have been saved. They may even receive the Holy Ghost at one time. But because they neglected their mind and neglected to take on a spiritual mind and do away with the carnal mind, it leads to lukewarmness and eventually death. A carnal mind is death. And if a child of God continues to neglect the mind, it will lead eventually to their spiritual death. Because a carnal mind is controlled by feelings, by self, not faith, not the Word of God. A carnal mind is not subject to the will of God. In fact, a carnal mind will resist the will of God, as so many Christians in the past have done. Paul exhorts, let your carnal mind be transformed to be renewed into a spiritual mind, the mind of Christ. For if God can transform your soul, your eternal soul, and make it new, the same can be done for your mind if you seek after it and you want it and will it. Divine blood is the power to transform your soul, to make it born again. The Word of God will sanctify your mind. The Word of God will transform it. The Word coupled with prayers and fastings will enable your mind to match your soul. 
And that's the goal. The prayer closet shuts out the world and it puts you in the presence of God where you need to be to take on the mind. Fastings afflict the soul. It keeps self under subjection, keeping self humble before the Lord. That's what fasting does. You live in a body of flesh. You live with feelings. Feelings are with you 24-7. So you must contend with it. And you must keep feelings, self, flesh, under subjection to God. You must take on the spiritual mind. Because if you don't, self and feelings will dictate. And that displeases God. Without faith, you can't please God. The just shall live by faith. A lot of Christians down through the years have lived in their feelings. Feelings and self dictated just about everything they did. But they felt they were okay because they weren't committing acts of sin. But that doesn't mean you're pleasing God just because you don't commit acts of sin. You could be disobeying the will of God. God may want you to go this way, and you're going this way. Do you think you're pleasing Him? Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. You must continually contend with the body of flesh you live in keeping it under subjection, keeping feelings out of the way. Feelings can never dictate anything in your life. Only the Word of God, only the will of God. That's what it means to live by faith. That's what it means to please God and do His will. Because remember, it's living by faith. This is how the righteousness of God will be revealed in your life, will be manifested in your life, living by faith. Friend, listening to this message tonight, where are you at? Are you in your feelings, in the flesh? Or are you in faith, in the Word of God? What dictates your daily life? The Word of God? or feelings in flesh? Do you ever consider God from day to day? If you want to please God, it's time to reconsider your ways. And friend, if there's any sin in your life, that's not living faith to faith. Sin is a manifestation of the flesh of self. Sin and the flesh go hand in hand. It's all enmity against God. God has no part of you. You have no part of God when sin manifests in your life. It's time to give your heart to Jesus. It's time to live by faith. And to come into that place, it's only through the blood of Jesus. Pray with me right now. Say, Oh God, save my soul. Forgive me for all of my sin. I am so sorry for sinning against you, but no more. I will serve you, Lord, the rest of my life. And I believe the power in the blood of Jesus washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, dear Jesus. And amen. And friend, if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours. You can receive healing, deliverance. Jesus' sacrifice, fulfilling the plan of redemption for you. It was twofold. Salvation for your soul, and yes, healing for your body. With his blood stripes, we are healed. And if you will just put your trust, your confidence in the word of God that says, by his blood stripes, we are healed, 
you can receive that healing, that healing virtue from that promise, from Jesus' sacrifice. Put your hand against mine on the screen right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring the people before you now. God, do move for them. Lay a healing hand upon each one. Lord, we honor you and we praise you for Jesus, for the sacrifice that he made that we may be whole. And Lord, let the healing virtue of the blood flow to them now. In the holy blood name of Jesus, heal. In the holy blood name of Jesus, heal them now. Lord, touch them. Deliver them. Let healing virtue, let life flow from the blood. And we'll give you the honor and the praise and the glory in the blood name of Jesus. And amen. And friend, watch every sign of improvement and give God praise, honor, and glory. And let us know what God did for you. And you need the Holy Ghost. Salvation is one step. The Holy Ghost is the next step. Many steps to make in the Lord, to climb higher in Him, to please Him with your life. And if you've yet to receive the Holy Ghost, you can receive Him. And those of you here tonight, if any of you are in need of prayer, this is your opportunity to get up, go over to the side. There I'll minister unto you. And the rest of you sitting there, come to the altar tonight. But those of you watching by way of the live stream, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, I'd like you to stand to your feet. Maybe in your home, bedroom, living room, wherever. Stand to your feet in the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands and you start praising Jesus. Giving Him glory, lifting up praise from your heart with your lips. Praising Him continuously. And I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask the whole God to anoint you to receive the Holy Ghost. This power from on high. And it's God's gift to you. Yes, you can have it. By faith, trust the Word of God and believe and accept. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring the people before you tonight. Lord, do anoint them. Anoint them in a mighty way to receive your gift of the Holy Ghost. In the holy blood name of Jesus, receive this gift, this power from on high. In the name of Jesus, receive. In the name of Jesus, God, anoint each one. In the holy blood name of Jesus, anoint each one to receive. Lord, bless them, anoint them, fill them with the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, in the holy name of Jesus, in the holy name of Jesus. Praise in Jesus. Yes. Glorify in Jesus. Praise in Jesus. Love in Jesus. Glorify in Jesus. Praise in the King. Praise in Jesus. Love in Jesus. Just you and Jesus. Praise in Jesus. Yes. Lifting up those praises. Lifting up those praises. Just you and Jesus. Me white as snow. No other fountain.
can hear his still small voice. He's calling me to move in closer. I can feel him as he draws me with his love. His love, his nail scarred hands are reaching out to give me strength, to give me power. Play.